in the Scandinavian countries where you have these social these registries that have people's health history, yeah. birth history, divorce history, job history, and right. so forth, on um, millions of people. If you if you look at their, their, their life histories, their actual real life histories, not self-reports, in relationship to these polymorphisms, it might be quite interesting because you can get you can you can test people and then get your data uh, run with the life history data. Yeah. That's a really interesting idea. Do you know how big their samples are, or like yeah, whole okay, okay, everybody has to be registered. In, in, in Finland, and Sweden, and Norway, and Denmark, they have different registries, but, but in each case, it's a whole country. And they have, they know when you went to the psychiatrist. They know when you got divorced. They know what your grades were. And is there already so presumably the genotyping is voluntary though, right? Well, you'd have to do that. Yeah. Okay. But at least the life histories are there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I had another question about polymorphism. Um, if I was looking at your data right, did, did you have conflicting evidence for dominance of the A and G in the polymorphism? I'm not sure if dominance is the right word to use for non coding Yeah, sequences, exactly. But the A, A G is patterned differently. Yes. In the two studies you yes. had. Yes, mm -hmm. right. That is absolutely true. Um, in the first study, the A G is patterned with the G G's. Uh -huh. And the, in the other study presented, the A G is patterned with the A A's. So you're right. There's there's a there's an underlying question there that um, we don't know what's going on. I I will point out that's not just the case with the two studies that I presented today. Um, if you go back to the slide, yeah. Um, if you look a little bit more carefully in the results here, you see different patterns. Sometimes you see a dominance effect, a dominant effect. Sometimes you see a recessive effect. Sometimes it's like you know it's it's it's. Um, dose dependent, like that the ages are right in the middle of the two. Right. So it's unclear at this point. I mean, I would say it's still pretty early in, in this line of research to really know what's going on, whether it really is the case that those findings would be robust for the ages and that, um, you know, in some cases, depending on the outcome you're looking at, um, that having half the, you know, number of receptors or, or ha whatever is bad for the AAs, for example, like, if you're half affected, maybe it's okay in some cases, but it's not okay in other cases, right? That's one possibility. The other possibility is that we simply, yeah, that I mean, we haven't run enough studies to really nail down these patterns. Um, yeah, so the, the study that turned out the, the somewhat surprising result for you and your colleagues in which the stress boys were right? Mm -hmm. um, they saw the ambiguous face. Now it was uh, more of anger and happiness, or anger and fear. Anger and fear. Anger and fear. And they tended to see less anger and more or fear. more fear, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, and then the final uh, study that you showed, in which the muscular guy mm -hmm. was seen as more likable and a, a potential better um, prospect of the print. Mm -hmm. I, my first thought when you presented the surprising finding with distressed uh, mm -hmm. boys was that it could be related to an increase in oxytocin or oxytocin-related symptoms that's actually brought about by the stress? Because is it not the case that there's a sort of parasympathetic and oxytocin-related yes, yes. attenuation? Right. And that could be similar to what you see in the last study, maybe. OK, so the, the boys who are being stressed are releasing more oxytocin. Maybe. And there, therefore, you see a kind of social approach kind of. Uh, or at least an attenuation of. The, the, of the stress, the kind of so it's a paradoxical effect of the stressor. Yeah, stress yeah I, I think that's definitely possible. I think that's a great thought. Um, I think, again, yeah, I, I don't think that that's the only possible uh, uh, response to, to uh, stress. So again, I think it would be interesting to look for inter uh, individual differences or, or yeah, subtle differences in the context of stress that either lead to potentially more oxytocin release or less oxytocin well, release. I, I have a little bit of data. It's preliminary. But um, okay. my so colleagues and I um, have been involved in research on aggression and, and stress and, and uh -huh. some endogenous salivary oxytocin measures. Okay. Using the recent assay that's called, that seems to, to be uh, the track well with plasma going. Okay. Um, and we've got, and I don't want to say much because it's preliminary and we're figuring it out, but one reason it's confusing okay. is we're finding links in the data between stress and, and, um, and oxytocin. So we've got some indication that it, it is increasing. Mm -hmm. um, it's making interpretation of some of the effects because we have two completely opposite pathways leading to this increase. Right. So we have yeah. people who are 
being more palliative or, or, or at least less stress to the heart rate measure because that's showing more oxytocin. But, but also people with more stress. With more people, more yeah. stress also showing oxytocin. Yeah. So it could be kind of, but it's all very formal. That's very interesting. Yeah. We should definitely talk about, more about that later. Yeah. I have a question for the last study you presented uh, that friendship from us from confirmation. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, you're claiming that because the oxytocin reduced the threat, so that people are more um, tend to make a friendship with a stranger, how do you know if it's not because the oxytocin is going to increase the sociality as in general, but not mm -hmm. reduce the threat mm -hmm. to be uh, specific? Yeah, I think that's an alternate explanation. However, you don't see it, uh, you don't see it increasing the ratings of the, uh, it's a crossover interaction, right? So, so, so there's no significant difference for the normal guy. Right? So if oxytocin is simply increasing overall prosociality, right, without regard to um, how threatening the guy is to, at baseline, then you might expect that this the oxytocin in people would be higher in both across both conditions, right? It could, yeah. I mean, there's alternate explanations. This could be a ceiling effect, so this scale goes up to nine. Mm -hmm. So maybe our heterosexual men are not willing to rate themselves as like a nine you know, in any case. Um, so yeah, you're right. There, there could be an alternate explanation here. Again, I don't have direct evidence that it's, it has to do with threat. However. That explanation would be consistent with prior findings about oxytocin downregulating threat responses, um, and it's it's my own personal <laughs> intuition of what's going on here. But yeah, I, I am running follow-up studies to more test that more directly. Um, do you, do you think it would be possible to uh, look empirically at what kinds of evolutionary forces might be? maintaining that genetic polymorphism, whether it's some kind of balancing selection or simply a yeah, selection. that's a great question. Um, so, I don't know if, if any of you guys are familiar with Jay Belsky's recently recent theorizing about differential, the differential susceptibility hypothesis. Um, so, basically, you know, I presented this slide saying that uh, that basically if you take this picture, um, you see um, that the allele is linked to all these things that are bad, right? And, and so then the question becomes, well evolutionarily, why would, why would this allele be maintained in the population at a relatively high, I mean it's a minor allele, but it's, it's still there. Um, it's not extremely rare. Um, why, why, would a, why would evolution maintain something that simply leads to bad outcomes, right? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I say these things as a sort of shorthand and a simplification, and to call a risk allele is probably misleading. I mean, that's the terminology that epidemiologists, I think, use, you know, risk, they can call anything risk or something. Um, but in fact, I think perhaps a more parsimonious explanation, at least Jay Belsky would certainly claim this, um, that um, perhaps one version of the gene is, um, differentially sens uh, sensitive to, or more sensitive to social input, right? So like, under good early experience and under good social conditions, the G allele makes you more pro-social or makes you whatever, at least to these good social outcomes. But at the same time, if you had really bad early experiences and um, bad, you had a bad social context, then, then you would see like the differential susceptibility making these Gs also more uh, susceptible to these really bad effects, whereas the As might sort of hang out in the middle somewhere a relatively insensitive social context or social uh, input. Um, so that's certainly one possibility. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I follow up yeah, on that? Yeah. Um, with apologies. We'll, we'll ask the next question. Um, the serotonin transporter allele varies, uh, alleles vary enormously uh, from, from uh, population to population around the world uh, in, their, yes. in their frequency. And, there's been some speculation by John Chow and others that what's adaptive in one social system is maladaptive in another. In other words, extreme sensitivity in certain to social feedback and whether you're doing the right thing and people 
food and what you're doing might be extremely important in a society where it's with very low mobility and where you really, your, your fitness depends on getting along well with other people. And it might be actually maladaptive in a more frontier kind of situation mm -hmm. with more freedom mm -hmm. and autonomy and more <clears throat> opportunities for social mobility and so forth and so on. I wonder if the same thing might be true here, mm -hmm. that, that it's not just that, uh, <coughs> that the AL might be uh, beneficial under certain kinds of uh, adverse right. uh, childhood experiences, right. but it might be beneficial in certain uh, cultures with certain kinds of social systems. I think that's a very plausible hypothesis. And um, this particular SNP, RS5356, as far as I'm aware, there's not too, too much variability across um, different ethnicities in the uh, distribution of the alleles. Okay. However, there are other ones. RS2254298, which is another one I've looked at in some of my studies, does to look at the, the distribution of the alleles looks totally different in the Asians and in, in <coughs> Caucasians, for example. Um, so there's a positive. And, and also, there's, been, there's some findings that aren't entirely consistent with that particular SNP um, that potentially, I I think could could be a function of, of this um, possibility that you mentioned that is interacting with some sort of cultural differences in the adaptiveness of the social outcomes predicted by those genes. So this one doesn't vary a lot. Not as much. I mean, yeah. there's maybe a little. And I'm not enough of like a population, I'm not familiar enough yeah. with population genetics to sort of know what degree of variability you need to, need to, to be able to make these claims about, you know, differential actual um, selection in different ethnic populations versus just simple genetic drift, right, kind of random genetic drift, um, how, how, how big the differences have to be before you really can, can hypothesize that strongly. Um, the selection pressure. Yeah. 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 Yes. So could you briefly offer your opinion of the other studies that you briefly refer to that oh, yeah. show the negative effects of oxytocin sure. and what your oh, interpretation of those are? Yeah, it's an issue I'm very passionate about. Okay. Well, okay, so are you familiar with the studies yes. themselves? Yes. Okay, uh, the DeJoy studies probably. Yeah, the, um, I brought up another, I, I made a version of that slide that's a little bit more thorough. You can just give the bottom line, it's fine. Yeah, but, okay, this slide, I want to show you the... the I show you these two headlines, right? Mm -hmm. these, these are the two famous results that got a lot of media attention. One was published in Science 2010, one was PMS 2011. Uh, Carson DeJoy ran a, a, a number of really clever experiments um, manipulating like in-group versus out-group membership and look at giving the oxytocin nasal spray and seeing whether the oxytocin nasal spray differentially affects behavior towards in-group members and out-group members. I think the, the interpretation of his results are a little problematic uh, because uh, in, in many of the studies, there's a confound between in-group membership and selfish, in-group motivations, motivations to protect your in-group or benefit your in-group and selfish motivations. Because basically, if you look at the way the studies are designed, um, anything that you do, presumably for your, your in-group, also influences your out, uh, your outcome. And he uses kind of like uh, economic game uh, things. Um, so so I think that some of the effects that he's claiming about differences between in-group and out-group effects of, of oxytocin could boil down to selfish versus other-oriented effects. Um, this particular result, uh, oh, yeah, this is my other point. Uh, so this paper here, uh, this is a newer paper um, published in 2012 um, suggesting that it really depends a lot on whether the game is construed, that whether the economic situation and the conflict between this in-group and out-group status is construed as a, uh, a zero-sum game or whether it's not a zero-sum game. So in these contexts, it's a zero-sum game. Whatever is good for your in-group is kind of bad for the out-group, right? And then, of course, like, yeah, whenever you increase the tendency to be nice to your in-group, you're sort of decreasing um, tendency to be nice to the out-group. If you give people a situation in which it's not a zero-sum game, where they can kind of be nice to the in-group, but also be nice to the out-group, you see that oxytocin actually, at least in this one study, um, increases both the parochial altruism, meaning the altruism towards the in-group, and also universal altruism, so altruism towards the out-group, to a lesser extent, but it's not showing the full, you know, it's like the oxytocin is really good for the in-group and, and, and has positive effects on the out-group rather than um, splitting up. Um, yeah, this, this effect, um, well, here. Um, but even the but but even the trust paradigms are all all have to do with 
your personal game. I mean, the, the most, the trust paradigm to have to do with what you're going to get out of the game as well. So, right, right. So I don't think I'm necessarily disagreeing with you, but I, I, I wonder if these findings help us to refine thinking about what oxytocin is actually doing in the social situation, rather than saying it's, it's because it, it does seem to be related to trust, which is sort of self-involved and so on. So I wonder, so I've been looking at these a lot too, and I've just been wondering if some of the inconsistencies in the pro-social behavior findings, uh -huh. which often seem to be conditional on situation right, and right. interacting with this, interacting with that, I mean, could it be that oxytocin really is not a down, doesn't affect downstream behavior, but it really affects some initial processing yeah. of, say, friend or foe. Right. And then when we see oxytocin related to other behavior, it could, that could be a result of this initial determination of friend or foe, but it's not oxytocin that's regulating it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's why it gets so inconsistent sometimes. Not necessarily yeah. so as you show, but in a lot of other studies, and, right. and it seems to be conditional on situation and so on. But what, what seems to be striking to me is that there does seem to be something about, I need to figure out if this person, is this someone a friend of mine or not? Is this someone I should care for or cares for me or not? Or is this someone who's not in that category? Yeah. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I think, yeah, you're right that perhaps... It doesn't uh, help you act better. It just helps. makes helps you make that determination that someone's a friend, and then all of a sudden, all yeah. of that's so all the stuff. So would you predict, happens. I'm just curious, would you predict that oxytocin is... How would oxytocin act on that level of categorizing people as friend or foe? Would it make you just generally more likely to see them as friend rather than foe? Or, or well, you know, I was sitting here thinking about that, and I, I'm afraid this may sound like I'm just construing it the way, in, in the way that I think, but so, you know, so the effect on amygdala activation is fairly consistent, right? So perhaps that allows you to make that determination. Maybe it sort of minimizes the initial threat determination, right? Mm -hmm. So hold on a second, let's make this determination. Um, there are a lot of receptors in the mesolimbic reward regions as well. Those haven't been studied as much. Perhaps they're not as consistent. But those also are involved in valuation. I don't know. I'm, I'm grabbing here. But I'm just wondering if it doesn't necessarily affect, you know, visual perception, but it affects, you know, your emotional reaction and your valuation of that social stimuli. Yeah. And then all the other stuff, which tends to be inconsistent across studies, I think, is a function of that. Perhaps. Yeah. And that's why it's in, I don't know. I mean, well, I'm interested in what you... Because I'm trying, I think we have to interpret these other studies along with the pro-social behavior studies. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, there are a number of them suggesting that there is something about in-group, it's heightening in-group and out-group at a certain level. But maybe you don't agree with that. Um, I think Alan really wanted to respond to something first, so I'll, well, I think about that, Alan can jump in. Well, I mean, okay, so <clears throat> you stimulate the cervix or you lactate and you produce a big shot of oxytocin in the mom, right? The mom doesn't love everybody at that point. She loves her baby, right? And so the question is, if, if does, is oxytocin totally indiscriminate in terms of the targets that it, that it tells you to be affectionate toward? Or are there some preconditions, some cognitive processes, something else that says, I feel loving, let's see. Oh, I love that one, you know? I mean, now, when people, according to, I've never taken it, but according to people who take MDMA, which, which apparently works through release of oxytocin, it's pretty indiscriminate. But um, under other conditions, you know, you, you, when you feel in love, you, don't, you might sort of feel a little bit positive toward the whole world, but you love a particular person. And if that's mediated by oxytocin, whether it's the baby or your partner, the question is, oxytocin doesn't, there's got to be some discriminating mechanism. It doesn't just say love everybody. Love, the, love this person or these people. And that, it seems to me, is, is, is what you're asking about, and that's what we probably should be working on, is, you know, is how does the oxytocin uh, motivate you in a particular direction toward a particular target? I would say motivates you in both directions. It doesn't necessarily make you, it's not, I, perhaps it's not designed or maybe it's not evolved to make you love somebody but it's rather to be attuned to who is someone you may love or they may love you because your findings about the receptivity of social support as well. That sort of, this is someone that I should take support from, therefore it's going to have a greater effect on But in the, in, the prime, in the primeval system, the baby, take care of this baby uh, system there, it's, it's, it's totally about care, caretaking. I don't, I don't want to necessarily dismiss the, the caretaking finding, but oxytocin also does a lot of different things in the body 
in a lot of different purposes. It's not just single purpose. So it, it is possible that the same hormone neurotransmitter s serves different functions in these different situations. Well, I'm just trying to, I wasn't necessarily talking about the mother work, which it, I'm talking about sort of this, 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 this perception of who's in, who's out. Am I going to receive support? Is that support going to affect me or not? Should I give support or should I trust them? I don't know. Just speculate. Clark, I think, had it. Well, I was going to say, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, oxytocin actually is older than sociality. So, I mean, it's not phylogenetically. The ancestral state isn't even, isn't even, doesn't even have to do with mother. Well, certainly vaginal pressure. Certainly vaginal pressure is for controlling uh, peripheral blood vessel constriction. Right. And so, I mean, that's one the, of the things which, I mean, I'm kind of agreeing with Andrew on this, that if I mean, we could be seeing these sort of net results that you get from an oxytocin manipulation um, that have to do with if you average out the effects across all the tissues in the brain and the body and whatever, interacting with, with the receptor, you know, these receptor polymorphisms, you get these behavioral outcomes, but it could be that acting very differently on different tissues. And, and I mean, it seems consistent with, with what you're saying in your talk that maybe asking the question, is this the prosociality chemical or something mm -hmm. like that, is not necessarily the right way of yeah. framing it because it has different effects on different, in different yeah. situations and different tissues and it doesn't have just a single function. Yeah. Um. We're well, just throwing in the following up on that. So, again, <laughs> in the preliminary stage, but we have some data on oxytocin and lactating mothers and aggression. And there seems to be at minimum a positive trend. So these are women who are being antagonized right. by a veteran. Mm -hmm. And not only are they more aggressive in response, mm -hmm. um, and there are babies in the next room, right? Not immediately there, but babies in the building. Okay, how um, are they being antagonized? Um, the Bushman, I don't know if you're done enough time, but there's this, this um, aggression paradigm by Brad Bushman, which is basically involves a competition. And it, each round, the winner can blast the other with white noise. It's more or less ethical shock. Okay. You know? um, so they're being blasted by this really bitchy confederate who's been trained to act in a rude way first. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, but anyway, long story short, being that we have some, we, we definitely have the behavioral, um, uh, uh, the, these lactating moms are more aggressive. Okay. They're a lot more aggressive. Yeah. Um, but and interestingly, they're also not more angry. Um, and we, this didn't come out, we, so some of this, um, most of this work got published in Psych Science, but one thing we didn't include just because of certain peripheral is we had them rate, rate how much they, they liked the other person. And it, they didn't, there was no effect at all on their sort of stated subjective feelings of antagonism. If anything, a little bit the other way. Um, so what we're getting wasn't oxytocin leading to this. It's often, in the Jews' work is often portrayed as if it's dark. As if these are people who not only love the in group but they hate the out group, and that's not. He never says that. It's not in any of the data. It's not what we found in our very focused case with okay. moms. Um, but I just think that's important to keep in mind. But but we have some evidence of of a link to aggression. But then again, aggression also gets a bad rap. I mean, mm -hmm. in in the case of a mom defending her her baby or right. by extension herself because baby relies on her. I don't necessarily want to call that pro-social, but I don't want to call it anti-social. Yeah. Well, her baby, the closer she feels to her baby, the more ready she may be to be protective yeah. and angry toward the people and not even protective. And, and that's love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, there's more than one relationship there. So the more the closer she feels to one, the more she may say to the other back off. Yeah. So but threatens. But the, I, yeah, I don't, that's not a dark side. No, exactly. Okay. Uh, vasopressin too, you know, especially if we study samples of healthy men a lot, you know, it's, it's 
it's often the distinction is thought to be that oh, success is more relevant for females, uh, the is more relevant for males. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely relevant. If you look at if you look at the animal literature, nasal present is as interesting or, or more for, for male social behavior as oxytocin is, right? The, I think the only reason, honestly, that, that hasn't been really translated well into human findings is for like logistical reasons. That the oxytocin is is it's easy like easier to get the ethical approvals and whatever to, to run this, those studies uh, because you can basically get a, the form of um, picotin, like, like the What's been what's produced for inducing labor and for um, stimulating breastfeeding, uh, and, and it's known, you know, it's it's, it's a relatively well utilized, well studied substance, and you can run studies using it. Whereas with vasopressin, my understanding, and, and Marcus is answering to me when I asked why aren't we running studies with that um, here, is is yeah, it's, it's actually I think there is one one drug that has it in it to help with bedwetting. Because of this purpose of the basic construction that you mentioned, um, but it's, it's somehow just logistically it's, it's uh, more complicated to run the studies with humans. But yes, I, I do totally agree that it's uh, under study period.